Good day. This is the first knowledge clip developed for the Constitutional and Administrative Law course. In this knowledge clip, I want to set out some of the highlights in the books we're discussing. And today I'll give you some of the main points discussed in the introduction to our book on comparative constitutional law. Now, this introduction sets out why one would uh, want to engage in comparative constitutional law and also gives some of the main concepts and main divisions in the field of constitutional law. First, why would one want to engage in comparative constitutional law? Well, Hieringa gives three main reasons. The first is that by comparing constitutions, one gets to appreciate one's own system even better. Another reason is that comparing constitutions can help um, constitution building and constitutional engineering in a given context. And a third reason is that comparing different constitutional traditions is a crucial element in building and developing international organizations. So there's a lot of reasons to engage in comparative constitutional law, but there's also big critiques of the whole idea of comparing constitutions. For one, people say that countries differ too much in their history, in their cultures, in their traditions to be compared. Another thing that you often hear is that constitutional transplants, so taking constitutional concepts from one country and moving them to another is actually dangerous and unworkable. And there's a third set of critiques which you often hear in America, and that is if judges engage in comparing constitutions, they're actually submitting people in a given country to laws which were set in another country in a context where those people had no influence. So there's a lot to say in favor and there's a lot to say against constitutional engineering. And the big question is, of course, the purpose of this uh, exercise of constitutional engineering. Why do it? Well, in thinking about that, one has to think a bit more about what constitutions do. And basically, constitutions set out to do three things. First of all, the role of a constitution is to set up and to maintain an effective state. Another purpose of constitutions is to establish and to respect democracy. And the third purpose of constitutions is to ensure that everyone abides by the rule of law. Now, these three aspects, and this is why I'm making a triangle, um, are in a delicate balance with each other. An effective state on the one hand, democracy on the other, the rule of law, on the other, can sometimes even go against each other. And the important thing of constitutions is also to find a balance between these different concepts. And we'll be discussing this extensively. But before we do that, let's turn to issues of definition. For instance, what is a constitution? A narrow or a formal meaning of constitution um, states that this is the central written document that sets out the basic rules that apply to the government of social political entities in particular states. So that's a narrow definition. One can also choose a broad, a substantive definition, and that is one that comprises all the fundamental rules in a given socio-political entity. So this can be other laws, a constitution can also include what's laid down in international treaties. So in this sense, um, constitution has a broader and much more substantive meaning. Now that we have that out of the way, it will be clear that there's many different kinds of constitutions all over the world. Still, 
a constitution in its substantive broad sense generally always does three things. Each constitution has three different main characteristics. Firstly, it attributes power to public authorities. So constitutions give public authorities power. The second thing that every constitution does is that it regulates the fundamental relations between public authorities, between the national, the provincial, the local government, between parliament, government and the judiciary. It regulates um, relations between them. A third very important function is that it regulates fundamental relations between public authorities and the individual, often in a Bill of Rights. So these are the functions of each and every constitution. An important division in constitutional law is that generally there's a division between institutional law, very much about the attribution of power, and uh, human rights, which is about the individual vis-a-vis -vis the public authorities. Now, you see um, that not all constitutional rules need to be laid down in a constitution as a central given document. There's countries in which large parts of the constitution are, for instance, unwritten, like the United Kingdom. Or there's um, countries like Sweden, where the constitution is laid down in four fundamental laws. So there's big differences between countries, but they all have these three attributes. Another first thing to consider is where to find constitutional law. Well, if you take constitution in the substantive sense, you'll find constitutional law possibly in a basic written document, but also in international treaties here in Europe, in EU law. You'll find it in case law, in customary law, in secondary legislation. So that's laws not passed by parliament, but by other bodies. And you'll find um, constitutional law in scholarly writing, which sets out the interrelationship between these sources. Now that we've defined constitutions, let's turn to the definition of constitutionalism. What do we mean by constitutionalism? Constitutionalism is the idea of limited government, where the exercise of public power is governed and constrained by a constitution and the rule of law. So the constitution, the rule of law, strain, constrain, stop the exercise of uh, public power. Now, of course, this is in a way the most important um, function, the most important document in public life. And all this explains why constitutions often have a very different uh, degree of flexibility than other laws. Often constitutions are much more difficult to change than other laws um, because of their functions. Generally, you can uh, distinguish between rigid and flexible constitutions um, or entrenched and more flexible constitutions in which rigid constitutions are the ones that are more difficult to change than ordinary ones. Now, how are constitutions as the basic written documents made rigid? There's many ways in which countries do that. For instance, in um, Germany and Portugal, you need a supermajority in Parliament to change the constitution. In the Netherlands and Sweden, if you want to change the constitution, you need two readings of the amendment with elections in between. There's also countries that require a constitutional amendment to be ratified by all the subunits of that country. For instance, in the US as a federal state or in India, to some extent also in the European Union, there's this uh, requirement. 
And some countries um, just call out a referendum for constitutional change, as is the case in Australia and France. You even have certain aspects of constitutions which can never be changed, like the Ewigkeitswerte in Germany, certain um, constitutional values of which the constitution itself determines that whatever happens, whoever comes to government, that cannot be changed. In all this, you have to make a distinction between formal and substantive rigidity. So a constitution may seem very difficult or easy to change on paper, but in practice, um, things can be very different. And this also has to do with the ideas of and the rules on interpretation of the constitution. Do judges consider the constitution as a document that can never be changed? Do they take a literal interpretation or do they um, consider the constitution to be more of a living instrument to be interpreted in the light of the times? These are two different ways of interpretation that also make up the flexibility of constitutions. So I've spoken a bit about um, rigid and more flexible constitutions. Another distinction to um, look at is uh, the difference between revolutionary and evolutionary constitutions. Often in uh, history, constitutions are set out to really mark a new moment. Um, in a country's history to really start a new era, to get rid of the monarch or to entrench the power of the monarch again, to start a socialist state, to start, as in Germany, uh, a new republic after the Second World War. And in distinction uh, constitutions, you can look at revolutionary and evolutionary constitutions. Revolutionary constitutions, for instance, are the constitutions of France, of Germany, as I already said, of South Africa, uh, really that came out of a change. And evolutionary constitutions are the ones that have accrued slowly, time over time, little change after little change, like, for instance, in the United Kingdom. So these are different types of constitutions. Let's, as a final point, look a bit at terminology. For instance, as a first concept, state. State has different meanings. State can mean the public authority. So the state does this or the state does that. Um, a state in its international context, for instance, but state can also be synonymous to, to government. So this is another important uh, distinction. A uh, state can also stand for a sovereign country, so a state, an independent state. And in federal context, um, the states can also be federal entities. So in Germany, and in Nigeria and in the United States of America, there's different states that together comprise the federal state. So these are different usages of the word state. In um, engaging in constitutional law, it's equally important to look at different meanings of the word government. Government can stand for state order, it can also stand for the executive, but it carries out uh, power, but the government is often also used for the governing majority, so the governing political majority. And here the usage of the term kind of stands for what it's set to, uh, set to mean. Another term used in different ways is republic. Republic can stand for um, the Republican government. It can stand for a state with a Republican order, but it can also stand for a certain period in time. 
during the Republic, for instance. Okay, so in this brief clipping, I've set out why one would want to engage in comparative constitutional law, but also what some of the drawbacks are, what the purpose of constitutions are generally, and also how to define a constitution. And in moving towards the topic of comparative constitutional law, I've looked at different ways of distinguishing between constitutions, rigid and flexible constitutions, evolutionary and revolutionary constitutions. And after that, I've looked at some of the key terminology. All this as a summary of what is written in Heringa, chapter one, and as an introduction to our more in-depth discussions on the topic. Bye-bye.